All right, so to create an AWS account, we need to navigate to aws.amazon.com. Then click on create an AWS account in the upper right corner. Enter your email address. Then enter your password. As you can see, the password must be at least eight characters long and contain at least three of the following uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, non-alphanumeric characters. Repeat your password. Now we need to choose the account name. You can pick whatever you like. As you can see, we can change the account name in our account settings later on. I'm going to name it 0-2-Hero. Click on continue. Fill in the capture. And click on continue again. We will be using the account for our own projects. So choose personal. Then enter your name. Your phone number. Choose the country or region. I'm currently living in the UK and enter your address. Agree to the terms of service and click on continue. We need to provide AWS with the credit card information. This is a required step and without it you can't create an account. The good news is that AWS Lambda free tier includes 1 million free Lambda invocations per month, which we won't exceed by any means. Also, if you use any AWS service that is not included in the free tier, I will give you a heads up so you can decide whether to follow along or skip that part of the course and just watch me. AWS will charge you $1 to verify the credit card information. This transaction will be reverted within 5 days, so you will get your dollar back. I need to confirm the transaction with my bank via their mobile app. Now we need to verify our phone number. I'm choosing to do the verification via text message, but you can do it through the voice call as well if you like. Then filling the capture. And click on send SMS. If you've added your phone number correctly, you should receive the verification code any second now. Mine is 0897. Click on continue. We definitely want to use the free plan, so just scroll down and click on complete sign up. And we have successfully created our AWS account. Now click on go to the AWS management console. Now sign in as a root user with the credentials we have just used to create the account. Fill in the CAPTCHA again. Enter your password. And welcome to the AWS Management Console. We will be spending the majority of our time in here. But before we have a look around, we should do one other not so exciting thing and that is to create an admin user. 
Even though this step is unnecessary and has nothing to do with the actual Lambda service, it is strongly recommended to do so after you create a new account. Just so you know that I'm not making this up, as you can see, the official documentation states and I quote, we strongly recommend that you do not use the root user for your everyday tasks, even the administrative ones. Instead, use your root user credentials only to create your IAM admin user. So we might as well do that. New users are created through the AWS Identity and Access Management service. To find the service, just search for IAM. Click on the service and click on users and add users. Let's call them admin. Select AWS access type. We want them to be able to log in with a password. So select password. Click on custom password and enter the password. And uncheck require password reset because we don't want to create a new password every time we sign in. Click on next. We now need to give our user an admin privileges, which we can do by attaching an existing admin policy to the user. So click on attach existing policies directly and select administrator access. Then click on next. We don't want to add any text to the user. Click next again and click on create user. And close. And our admin user has been created. Just to sum up, our new admin user has almost all the privileges that our root user has. We are currently still logged in as the root user. Now let's sign out and sign in as our newly created admin user. To do so, click on dashboard and copy the sign-in URL from IAM users in this account. Open a new tab and paste the URL and enter. Make sure you bookmark it so you can easily log back in. To do so, click Command D and done. As you can see, we were signed out from our root user as soon as we have navigated to the sign in URL. Now let's sign in as the admin user. The IAM username is admin, enter your password. Make sure you click on remember this account, otherwise You'd have to enter the account ID every time you sign in. Click on sign in. We are now logged in as the admin IAM user, which is indicated in here. The drop down looks a bit different from when you are signed in as a root user. Okay, we have our admin user created. Next, let's give a brief introduction of the AWS Management Console. Welcome to the landing page of AWS Management Console. If we click on services in the top left corner, we will get a list of every AWS service. If you're totally new to the AWS, please don't be discouraged by the sheer number of services you can see here. We will be focusing only on what we are all here today for, and that's the Lambda service. We can click on the little star next to it so it shows up in our favorites menu. Next, we have the search bar, where you can search for all those services. Let's type in Lambda. And there is our Lambda service again. Next, we have the account menu that we are all familiar with from the previous video. And finally, the region menu. This is the list of physical locations where AWS data centers actually are. As you can see, I'm currently connected to the Ireland region. If we go to aws.amazon.com, go to learn, AWS global infrastructure, regions and AZs, and click on Europe, Middle East, Africa map, for example. 
we can see a bunch of orange circles that are representing the regions. Feel free to ignore the blue circles. The reason why I'm telling you this is that Lambda is a region-specific service, which means that if we are connected to the Ireland region, as we are right now, and we create a Lambda function, the Lambda function is physically placed in the Ireland data center, which means that if we were to connect to the Stockholm region, for example, we wouldn't see our Lambda in the management console. I will quickly demonstrate that. Let's go back to the management console. Let's search for the Lambda service and click on it. As you can see, I have already created a Lambda function in the Ireland region. Don't worry, we will go over the steps on how to create one in the upcoming video. Now, I'll change the region to Stockholm. As you can see, we have no Lambda created in the Stockholm region. You can pick whatever region you like. Maybe pick the one that is geographically closest to you. Or if you want to be safe and follow my steps exactly, which I recommend, pick the Ireland region. All right, let's finally start doing some actual work and create our first Lambda function. Let's navigate to the Lambda service. As you can see, I've deleted the Lambda function from the previous video. So let's create ourselves a new one. Click on create function. We want to create the function from scratch. Let's call it first function. And we will be writing our functions in Python. So let's select the Python 3.8 runtime. The instruction set architecture of a function determines the type of a processor that Lambda uses to run the function. We will be using the x86, as the ARM is recommended to use in compute-intensive applications such as a high-performance computing, which is not our use case. And click on create function. This is going to take a few seconds. And there is our dummy lambda function. The function currently does nothing exciting. It only returns a JSON object with status code of 200 and a body. Right, so AWS Lambda is an event-driven compute service, which means that in order to invoke it, in order to run the code, we need to pass it an event. An event is a JSON formatted document. So let's create ourselves a test event. Click on this arrow next to the test button Click on configure test event. Let's name it test event. This example event has three key value pairs, which is fine. Click on create. Our test event has been created. So we can now invoke the function by clicking on the test button. The code has run successfully. We can now see the execution results. The test event name is the name of the test event we have just created. Response is our Python dictionary serialized into JSON. Function logs. This is the point where the execution of our function started. This is where it ended. Report of the function. The function ran for 1.53 milliseconds. If this is a second, then 1.53 milliseconds is roughly this much. Build duration, 2 milliseconds. We won't be charged for that. Our Lambda has access to 128 megabytes of memory, of which it used only 39 megabytes. And it took our Lambda 157 milliseconds to initialize. All right, let's add some logging to the function. Let's do a print, so far so good. When we modify the function, we need to deploy our changes. As you can see, the console is telling us that the changes are not deployed. So click on deploy. When we test our function again, we should see the so far so good output in the console logs. And there it is. If we change our code and forget to deploy the changes, let's change it to 
so far not so good. Let's test the function without deploying it. It still says so far so good. We need to deploy the changes in order for them to take effect. I can't even tell you how many times I forgot to deploy my changes and spent like an hour investigating what's going on with my Lambda. So please keep this in mind. You need to deploy the changes. All right. So other than Lambda being an event driven compute service, it's also a serverless compute service. But before we talk about serverless, let's quickly clarify how Lambda pricing works exactly. When you check the Lambda product page, you can see that it says 1 million requests free per month. Now, that's great marketing, but there is a little bit more to it that you should know. If we click on pricing, scroll down a little bit and click on AWS pricing calculator, we can estimate the real price of our Lambda function. So, my Lambda function is in the Ireland region, so let's select that. We are using the x86 architecture and let's say we are going to invoke our Lambda 1 million times per month. Now, let me put the function logs from the previous video on the screen. As you can see, the Lambda ran for 1.42 milliseconds. We will be built for 2 milliseconds. So let's enter 2 into the duration of each request field. And also, our Lambda has access to 128 megabytes of memory. So let's input that as well into the calculator. Let's scroll down a little bit. Click on Show Calculations. Look at that, it would be free. Now what if the Lambda took 20 milliseconds to execute instead? Still free. How about 200 milliseconds? Still free. Okay, so what about two seconds? Still free. But what about 20 seconds? Ah, now you can see that if we would invoke our Lambda function 1 million times per month, and it would take 20 seconds to run each invocation with 128 megabytes of memory, it would cost us 35 USD per month. Don't worry, that is an absolutely insane number of invocations for learning purposes and we won't come even close to that number. So we should stay within the free tier. I just wanted to show you that you should take that marketing of 1 million free invocations with a grain of salt. You can go ahead and play with the values in the calculator so you get a feel of how much roughly lambdas actually cost, considering all of the factors like duration and memory instead of just considering the sheer number of invocations. Serverless is a broad term and it's kind of difficult to explain to beginners. What it basically means is that you are in charge of the code, but you don't control the server. I think the easiest way to show you that Lambda is a serverless compute service is to show you it's, let's call it a serverful counterpart, and that is an EC2 service. If I search for EC2, You can see that I have an EC2 instance created. To show you that I'm in control of the server, I'm going to connect to it. So if I click on the instance ID, click on connect, then connect again. I am now connected to the EC2 instance via session manager. I can check where I am with PWD navigate to the root directory with cd slash, list the name of the files with ls, check what Python version we have installed here, run Python, print something out, and stuff like that. You can't do that with Lambda. The server is not accessible. It is fully managed by AWS behind the scenes, so you can't make any modifications to the underlying server. Of course, this has a bunch of advantages and disadvantages. It all depends on what you're doing. There is much more to serverless, but I feel like it's not necessary to over explain the concept in the beginning. So let's leave it at that. Next, we'll look at the event argument. 
An event is a JSON formatted document that contains data for a Lambda function to process. The Lambda runtime, which in our case is the Python 3.8 runtime, converts the event to a Python object and passes it to our function code. So if we were to modify our test event to contain some data about, let's say, a person, let's do name John and age 30, click on save. In the body of the function, we can print out the event argument. So let's do that. Also, let's print out the type of the event argument. Deploy the changes and click on test. There is the content of the event. And also, event is a Python dictionary. And because it's a Python dictionary, we can easily retrieve the values from the object. So let's do that. Let's add print name and print h. Deploy the changes again and let's test it out. And there is the name and there is the age. Now, the event is a JSON formatted document, not necessarily a JSON object. So other than being a JSON object, it can also be, for example, a JSON array. So if we modify our test event again and let's return an array. We can save. Also, let's remove these two prints. Deploy the function again and test. Thanks to Python runtime, the JSON array has been converted to Python list. So the valid event can be whatever is a valid JSON, which is the array, the JSON object, for example, age 23, a plain string, an integer or a float, even null, which is a valid JSON document. But in 99% of the time, it will be a JSON object converted to a Python dictionary. Now, the event object contains information from the invoking service. In our case, we are the invoking service, so we decide on what the content of the event is and how it's structured. But what if we are in a situation where our function is invoked by some other AWS service, let's say an S3. If you're not familiar with S3, picture it as a Google Drive or an iCloud Drive, a place where you store some files. Let's say we have a working integration between S3 and our Lambda in a sense that if someone uploads a file to the S3, the S3 would invoke our Lambda with the information about the file. We can create ourselves a test S3 event from a template to get an idea on how such an event would look. So if you click on create new test event, and from event template, we select S3 put. As you can see, the event looks way more complicated than the one defined by us. There is a bunch of information in the event. Stuff like event version, event source. As you can see, the event originated from the S3 service. Event time, when the event happened and other stuff like the information about the saved file, the name of the file, the size of the file, and lots more information that can be useful. 
we will set up this particular integration between the S3 and Lambda later on in this course, so stay tuned. We now understand the event, so let's talk about the next argument, and that is the context. Context isn't as useful as the event, but of course there are situations where you need to use it. A context object is passed to your function by Lambda service. It contains information about the invocation, the function itself, and the runtime environment. Let's print out the context object. Uh, context. Deploy the changes and test. Look at that. A context is not a Python dictionary, as the event object usually is, but the context is actually an object of the Lambda context class. To see what we can do with the context, let's reference the documentation. I have a Lambda docs open in the other tab. If we go to working with Python and context, we can see all its properties. There is a property called function name, which should give us the lambda's name. Or we have a memory limit in MB property that should contain the amount of memory that the lambda has access to. And many more, but for now, let's try accessing these two properties. As you can see, the function name is first function and the memory limit is 128 megabytes. Just to confirm the memory limit, we can navigate to configuration and there it is. The function has access to 128 megabytes of memory. The context object has one interesting method called get remaining time in millis. It returns the number of milliseconds left before the execution times out. To understand this method, we need to first understand what function's timeout is. If we go to Lambda's configuration page, we can see that the timeout is currently set to 3 seconds. This value dictates how long a function invocation can last before it's terminated by the Lambda service. So if our code takes more than 3 seconds to execute, the Lambda will timeout. The maximum value you can set this to is 15 minutes. If you have code that takes more than 15 minutes to execute, Lambda is not suitable for your use case and you should look for some other service. Let's leave it the value at 3 seconds. Let's have a look at how it works. Don't forget to include the brackets, because this is not a property, this is a method of the context object. And deploy. We can see that we have 2999 milliseconds before the function will be terminated. Everything ran smoothly, so if we import time, and add sleep for one second. Print out the value of the context method again. We can see that the remaining time we have before the function is terminated is roughly two seconds. So what happens if we sleep for more than 3 seconds? If we sleep for, for example, 4 seconds, we can see that the lambda was terminated. It returned an error message of task timed out after 3 seconds. We can see the first print in the logs but because we've slept for 4 seconds after, and the lambda's timeout is set to 3 seconds, the code underneath was never executed. So the execution was 
terminated here. Rest of the code got never executed. Right, next we will talk about the handler and the return value. The handler is the entry point of your lambda function. When the function is invoked, the runtime passes two arguments to the function, event and context. Now, you can have multiple Python functions in your lambda. For example, here we have the lambda handler and the function print hello. If we test the function, we can see hello in the console log. But there is always only one lambda handler, one entry point. You can decide which function is going to be the handler. So let's create a new one. and deploy. Now, which of these ones will be the new handler is decided by the handler property. The lambda function part of it points to the name of the file. The lambda handler points to the function inside that file. So to make the lambda handler new, the new handler, we need to modify the handler value. And underscore new, save. All right, let's test it out. As you can see, we get an error. Lambda handler new takes zero positional arguments, but two were given. Can you guess which two were given to it? Yep, the runtime is trying to pass the event and the context to the new handler, but lambda handler new is not accepting any. So let's change that. You can name the arguments whatever you like. For example, E and C, John and Doe. But it just makes sense to call them event and context because that's what they are. Deploy and test again. And now we can see hello from Lambda handler new in the logs. So the lambda handler new is the new handler of our lambda function. You are not limited to put all your code into one Python file. You can create files and folders. For example, we can create a new file called utils.py. Let's add here some simple function. Let's also create a new folder. Let's call it ABC. And let's move lambda function.py into that folder. Let's go back to the function handler. Let's get rid of the old handler. Let's import the print hey function from utils. Let's use it inside the body. and deploy. Now, because we have moved the function handler to a different folder, we need to update the handler property. The handler is now in the ABC folder, and the way you work with the folders here is that you use slashes. ABC slash and save. Let's test it again. And we can see hey in the function logs coming from the utils file. Next, let's talk about the return value. The handler needs to return an object that can be serialized into JSON. Here we are returning a Python dictionary which can be transformed into a JSON. If we return something that can be transformed into JSON, for example, an instance of an exception here in the body, The lambda returns an error message, unable to marshal the response, object of type exception is not JSON serializable. We can also return, for example, just a string.
everything works fine. We can also return none. Everything works fine because JSON equivalent of none is null. You get the same results if you omit the return statement. That's because Python functions return none implicitly. As with the event argument, you will be working with dictionaries 99% of the time. When we created the lambda function, it wasn't the only AWS resource that's been created. One of them is CloudWatch log group, where all the log output from our function is saved. So if we navigate to CloudWatch by opening it in the separate tab, click on log groups, we can see a log group with the name of AWS slash Lambda slash first function, which as you might have guessed, contains all the logs from our previous function runs. And there you can see all the runs. They are saved into individual log streams. We'll talk about why the logs are separated into log streams later in this course. But for now, let's click on the latest one. There you see the familiar output from when we ran the function directly from the console. So when we run the function, These logs that we can see in the execution results tab are also being saved to CloudWatch. The CloudWatch log group wasn't the only resource created alongside our Lambda. Our function has to have permission to write its logs to CloudWatch. That's why the IAM role was also created and attached to our function as well. Let's search for the role inside the console. Search for I am. Let's open it up in the new tab. Click on roles. And there is the role that was automatically created for us. It name starts with first function, indicating what this role is for. If we go back to our Lambda, click on configuration, and permissions. Here we can see that this role is attached to our function. Just so we see it from all the angles, let's create a new function. When we are creating a new function from scratch, the permission section is telling us By default, Lambda will create an execution role with permissions to upload logs to Amazon CloudWatch logs. So we can see that we can create a new role, use an existing one, or create a new one from template. Lambda will create an execution role named my function name dash role dash some random string with permissions to upload logs to Amazon CloudWatch logs. So that's the point where the role was created. Let's see what such a role looks like. If we go back to IAM Management Console, click on the role. A role can have multiple policies attached to it. Our role has only one policy attached. Let's click on the policy. Let's click on Edit Policy and view it as JSON. This particular policy is saying that whoever assumes the role is allowed to create a log group, which is a resource right here. And is also allowed to create a log stream, which are these resources right here. And on top of that, it can save the individual logs into log streams which are these lines right here. Before we talk about the resource field, let's talk about what this ARN string right here is. 
Every resource in the AWS universe has a unique identifier called ARN. Our Lambda has it. Our policy has it. Even our log group has one. It stands for Amazon resource name. So if we open up the policy again and have a look on the second statement, it's saying whoever is assuming the role, in our case, it's our Lambda who's assuming the role, is allowed to create a log stream and save logs into that stream at this address, which is the ARN of our log group. If we change the effect on the second statement to deny, our Lambda function shouldn't be able to save logs into the log stream. So let's test it out. Review policy, save changes. First, let's delete all the logs we have so far so we can start with a clean slate. So if we run our function again, we shouldn't see any logs in CloudWatch because the role that our Lambda is assuming is denying the creation of the logs. We can see the logs in the execution results tab, but were they saved into the CloudWatch? Nothing is showing up here. Let's change the policy back. And there they are. Let's do a little recap of what we have learned here. When we have created the Lambda function, the AWS management console also created a CloudWatch log group and an IAM role with it. The role was automatically attached to the function and that's why the function is allowed to write logs into CloudWatch. The role can consist of multiple policies, but our role has only one policy attached to it. And that policy is allowing the Lambda to send logs to the CloudWatch. Lambda environment variables allow you to modify the function's behavior without updating the code. If we go to configuration, environment variables, click on edit and add environment variable. We can create our first environment variable. Let's call it hello underscore message. And let's put something into the value. Can save. We can now access the environment variable from the Lambda code. All we need to do is import OS. And print out the value of the variable. So, to modify the function behavior without modifying its code, we can update the environment variable. The main use case for Lambda environment variables is for when you have, well, multiple environments. Let's say you have two lambdas. Both of them are doing the same thing, storing some data into their corresponding databases. The difference is that one is a production lambda, the lambda that is actually handling live customer data. The other one is a staging lambda, used for testing purposes. They all need to connect to their databases, but rather than having two separate lambdas in our code base that differ only with the name of the database they are connecting to, you would have only one Lambda in your code base and retrieve the database name from the environment variable instead. 
feel free to pause the video here to have a better look. The env folder is not important here. I just want you to understand the use case. But the gist of it is that when you would deploy, for example, the production lambda, the environment variable would be set from the env slash dot prod file. This way you are maintaining only one function in your code base, but you have two lambdas in your AWS account, one for production, the other for staging. As you can see, we are able to use standard Python libraries such as JSON and OS in our Lambda function without any problems. That's because these libraries are included in the Python runtime itself. But what if you want to use some third-party libraries, for example, requests, so we can make HTTP requests from our Lambda function. If we try to import the requests now, The Lambda should complain with error message, hey, I don't know any requests module, as it's not a standard Python library and it's not included in the Python runtime. And there is the error message. To start using the requests library, we need to modify our Lambda code in a different way, rather to just changing the code in the console. We need to create a deployment package. First. Let's create a deployment package without any dependencies. Open up a terminal, or if you like your favorite IDE. I'll be using the terminal for the first part. Create a folder named my-function. Change directory to the folder. Create a file called lambda underscore function dot pi. Open up the file with Wim. Press I to go into the editing mode of Wim and let's start writing our desired lambda function. Hit escape, colon wq for write and quit and enter. Right, the deployment package has to be of a zip format, so we will use the built-in Unix zip utility to create the archive. If we go back to the console, we can click on upload from zip file. And save. And there is our new function code. Let's test it out. No module named abc slash lambda function. We have seen this error before. We have renamed the lambda handler, but haven't renamed the handler property. So let's quickly do that. And test again. And we can see that our Lambda function ran without any problems. Now, let's include the request library with our Lambda. I'll use VS Code for this part, just to switch it up a little bit. First, let's check whether we have pip installed. Pip is a package manager for Python. I have it, but I had to install it before by running sudo python-m 
ensure pip dash dash upgrade. Now we can run pip install dash dash target dot requests, which will install the request library in the root directory. We can now start modifying our function. and command s for save let's remove the old deployment package and let's create a new one oops i forgot the dot after now let's upload it to the console and test it out And there is our user data from Request Testing API. So we have our function bundled with the request dependencies. It's very likely that the majority of the lambdas we will create in the future will also require the request library. We could bundle the library with every function we will create as we are doing here, but that's code duplication across a lot of lambdas. What we should do is to save the request library in a separate storage somewhere and then reference it from the lambdas that require the library. This is a perfect use case for lambda layers. As with our deployment package, a lambda layer is a zip file archive. It can contain additional code or data that lambdas can use. So let's create a layer that will contain requests library. First, let's remove all the dependencies from a lambda. deploy. If we test the lambda now, it will fail because there is no request module available to it. So let's create the layer. Create a new folder and call it Python. We will explain later why the directory has to be named Python. Install the request library into the Python folder. Now create a zip archive called requests-layer.zip that contains the Python folder and everything in it. We can now upload our layer. If we click on the side menu and click on layers, create layer, name it requests-layer. Upload the file. Compatible architectures. Let's choose x86. And for compatible runtimes, let's choose Python 3.8. But also, let's make the layer available for functions that run Python 3.7, for example. Click on Create. Layers are versioned, that's why we can see that the layer version 1 was created. Now, let's navigate back to our function. As you can see, there are no layers currently attached to our function. Let's scroll down. Click on add a layer. We could use one of the AWS's predefined layers that are listed here. Or specify an ARN of a layer that's useful if you want to attach a layer that's from a different AWS account. But we want to use our custom layer. So select it from the drop down 
and so far we have only one version so select one and click add if we now test our function we can see that everything works fine the lambda has access to the request library through the layer now, the reason why we had to put our layer code inside a folder named Python is that when the Lambda function is initialized, the Lambda service will unzip the layer and will place it to the slash opt folder. What does that mean? Lambda is running on Amazon Linux operating system. To demonstrate that, let's import OS. And we will run a Unix command via Python, list the root directory. And look at that, there is the opt directory. This sometimes happens if you are too quick to deploy your Lambda function. So let's just go back, wait for it to save and deploy again. There is the Python folder from our layer. So let's see what's inside that folder. It's the content of our layer, the requests library with all of its dependencies. Now, the reason why we can import requests plainly by doing import requests here is that the Python path contains the slash opt slash Python directory. We can easily check that by importing sys. and printing the Python path to the logs. And there it is. So when you import requests, Python searches all these directories. One of them, this opt slash Python, contains our layer code, which contains the request library. That's why we had to name the folder Python. Trigger is a resource that allows you to invoke your Lambda function in reaction to an external event. We will demonstrate triggers on the following example. When someone saves a text file to the S3 bucket, we want that event to invoke our function. Our function then goes and retrieves that file, adds a footer to it and saves it back to the S3. Let's get started. First thing we need is an S3 bucket. If you're not familiar with S3, you can think of it as a Google Drive, a place where you just store files. And the good thing is that you can store 5 gigabytes of data in S3 for free. So let's navigate to the S3 service. As we can see, we have no buckets just yet. Click on create bucket. Bucket name has to be unique. If we try to name it something like test bucket, it's not allowing us to create it because a bucket with this name already exists in someone else's account. So let's try something like our first S3 bucket. All the other options are fine and click on create bucket. Click on the bucket and let's create two folders. One for photos. One for text files. So 
So what we want to achieve here with the lambda trigger is if someone uploads a photo to the photos folder, we don't want that event to trigger a lambda. But when someone uploads a text file into the text files folder, we want that event to trigger a lambda function. Now, let's open up our first function in a different tab. We can add trigger from the function overview. Or if we go to configuration, triggers, add trigger. As you can see, our Lambda can be triggered by a lot of AWS services, but we want to select S3. Select the bucket we've just created, event type, put, because we want the trigger to go off only when someone saves an object. Prefix, we want to trigger the Lambda only if an object is saved to the text files folder. If someone saves something to the photos folder, we don't want it to trigger a lambda. So the prefix will be text files slash, don't forget the slash. And we can use suffix as well. Let's do dot txt. So only if a text file is saved to the text files folder, the trigger goes off. But if someone accidentally saves a JPEG file into the text files folder, the trigger won't invoke our lambda. Now, pay attention to this blue box. If your function writes objects to an S3 bucket, ensure that you are using different S3 buckets for input and output. Writing to the same bucket increases the risk of creating a recursive invocation, which can result in increased lambda usage and increased costs. That's exactly what we are planning to do. Let's show the diagram of our plan again. So what the console is trying to warn us about here is a potential infinite loop. A text file is saved to S3. That triggers our Lambda. Lambda retrieves the text file from S3. We add a footer to the text file. Lambda saves the modified file back to S3, which triggers our Lambda again. Lambda retrieves the file again, adds a second footer to the file, saves it back to the S3, that triggers our Lambda again. And we are starting to see the problem. Even though we could solve this issue by saving the modified files to a different folder rather than saving them to the text underscore files folder, because remember, thanks to the prefix property, our lambda is going to be triggered only if a file is saved to the text files folder. But let's be cautious and follow the recommendation, which is to store the modified files, the files with the added footer, to a completely different S3 bucket. So let's quickly create a new bucket. Name it our first S3 output bucket. Hopefully the name is available. Nice. Back to our Lambda. One other thing to notice here is this line. Lambda will add the necessary permissions for Amazon S3 to invoke your Lambda function from this trigger, which is great as we don't have to manually create those permissions. So agree to the recursive invocation warning, click add. And there is our trigger. Let's check the permission that was automatically added for us. We need to refresh the page for it to show up. You might have expected that our Lambda execution role was modified, allowing to be invoked by S3, but our role is still only allowing our Lambda to create a log group, create a log stream, and saves logs into those streams. Let's see if we have any other permissions. No, that's it. The thing that was created for us is a resource-based policy. This was really confusing to me when I first saw it. But the difference between a role and a resource-based policy is that the role is basically saying, me, as a Lambda, I can do these things. I can create a log group, 
create a log stream, put log events. The resource based policy is saying me as a Lambda, I can be invoked by these services. In our case, the service is S3. We can open up the resource based policy document. It looks familiar. It has the same structure as the policies for our Lambda we saw before. It is allowing an S3 to invoke our function. It has also some other conditions that you can ignore. All right, let's modify our code. Let's open up the function logs. We can go to monitor and view logs in CloudWatch. That will open the log group directly. Let's delete all of them. And let's see if the function gets triggered when we save a text file into our S3 bucket. So the trigger is listening on our first S3 bucket text files folder. If we upload a text file here, I have a sample text file here. Upload and close. There's our text file. If we now check our logs, we can see that our function was triggered. Triggered by S3. Now, because of the prefix on the trigger, when we upload a text file to the photos folder, our function won't get triggered. And also, thanks to the suffix on the trigger, if we were to upload a JPEG file to the text files folder, our function wouldn't get triggered as well. So it's only going to trigger when a text file is saved to the text files folder. Now let's modify our function to see what the event actually looks like. It will look different because it's not us who's invoking the function, it's the S3 service. We can see that our lambda was triggered. There, looks familiar? It's the template event we talked about in the event lesson. Look, there's the name of the bucket and there's the name of the file. Let's extract them from the event because we will be needing them to download the text file from the bucket into our lambda so we can add the footer to it. The bucket name and the key object are nested quite deeply inside the event. Now, to retrieve the text file from the bucket, we will use a library called Boto3. It's a Python library used to interact with AWS services. So let's import it. You might think that we need to install it as a dependency, because last time I checked, Boto3 is not a standard Python library. But the truth is that Boto3 comes bundled with the Lambda runtime.
we are trying to access the text file. Let's see what we get if we trigger the lambda again. Ah, our lambda function code didn't have a chance to save properly. So let's fix that and deploy again. Okay, let's give it another go. We get an access denied, and that's because our Lambda has no permission to access the S3. It has a permission to be invoked by S3, that's what the resource based policy is for, but we are trying to access the S3. In order for that to happen, we need to modify the roles policy. So we are allowing our lambda function to get object from S3 from this particular S3 bucket. Please don't forget to include this slash asterisk at the end. It won't work without it. Let's upload the file again. And we can see that the content of our file is showing up in the logs. Right, let's make our life a bit easier here. Rather than uploading the text file and triggering the lambda that way, let's use our S3 test event from before. We need to only change the bucket name which is our first S3 bucket and the key of the object, which is text files slash text file dot txt. Let's clean up our logs. and test it with the S3 test event. We can now invoke our Lambda with a test event, which has the same structure as the real event coming from S3 when we upload the file. They are not identical, but the only fields we care about is the bucket name and the key of the object. Now, let's add the footer to the file and upload it to our output bucket. The first argument here is the name of the bucket where we want to store our modified text file. So that's our first S3 output bucket. Second argument is the name of the new file we are creating. That's text file with 
footer.txt. Body is the old body and we want to concatenate a string to it. New line footer. But because text file content is a byte string, we need to make our footer a byte string as well. Okay, deploy. Right, what do you think? Is this going to finally work? Click test. Of course not. Another issue with the permissions. Let's check the role again. Our Lambda can retrieve objects from our first S3 bucket, but it can't save objects to our first S3 output bucket. So let's add that permission. Let's test it out with the real file upload, because I have a feeling it's finally going to work. Alright, let's check the output bucket. Right, we can see that we have created a new file with the attached footer and saved it to the our first S3 output bucket. Let's do a quick recap. When someone uploads a file into our first S3 bucket slash text files and it's a file with a .txt suffix, our Lambda gets triggered. That's thanks to the S3 trigger we have here. Then our Lambda retrieves the bucket name and the file name from the event. That's this code right here. We then download the content of that file, attach a footer to it and upload it to our first S3 output bucket because we are scared of that recursion we were warned about. When you invoke your function for the first time, the Lambda service needs to prepare the execution environment for the function. It needs to download the function code that is stored in an internal S3 bucket. Then it has to create an environment with the specified memory, the runtime and all of the other configurations. Only after all these resources are allocated to an instance of your function, it can process the event. This initialization period is frequently referred to as a cold start. If another event comes in right after the first one was processed, the initialization period is skipped because we have a lambda that is ready to be invoked. This is called a warm start. Now, if our lambda doesn't receive any events from some period of time, the Lambda service decides to kill the Lambda instance. The time between the last invocation and the service deciding to kill the instance is unknown. It's internal to the AWS. Just so we have at least some idea on how much it takes, let's say it's something between 5 seconds and 5 minutes, but it can vary greatly. We can easily demonstrate this in our console. Let's comment out the S3 code. And let's print something out to the console. Let's invoke our function three times in a row. If we now check the logs, we can see three invocations. The first one the second one and the third one. The first invocation was a cold start, which is indicated by the init duration. So the first Lambda invocation took 362 milliseconds plus 1.8 milliseconds to return a response. The second invocation took only 1.13 milliseconds to return a response. 
The second one was a warm start. And the same goes for the third one, 1.25 milliseconds. I'm going to wait some arbitrary amount of time. My hope here is that the lambda service will decide to kill this instance of our lambda function, because it won't be receiving any new events. Ok, I waited for like 3 minutes. This might vary from your time you'd need to wait. Let's invoke the function two more times. You can see that a new log stream has been created. And that's because a new log stream is created for every new instance of a lambda function. That's indicating that we have waited enough time for the lambda service to kill the first instance of our function. Then we've invoked it again, so the service had to create a new instance. And as we know by now, the creation of a new instance is called a cold start. Let's open up the log stream. And again, the first invocation was a cold start. It contains the init duration time. The second one was a warm start. Because of this concept of cold and warm starts, it's highly recommended to initialize some of your resources outside of the function handler. When the function is invoked for the first time, in other words, when it's doing a cold start, all the code outside the handler is ran. So, the Boto3 library is imported, which takes some amount of time, and then the S3 resource is created, which also takes some amount of time. Then all the code in the handler is executed. Now our function is warm. So when the next event comes in, the Boto3 library is already imported and the S3 client is already created. So these resources can be reused, which saves the total execution time of our Lambda, which will save us money. We will now demonstrate the difference. Let's test our function with the S3 test event we have defined previously three times. One, two, and three. Now let's move the S3 resource initialization into our handler. Invoke it three times. Let me open the logs side by side here and show the screenshot. On the left, we have logs of the function that initialized the S3 resource inside the handler, which is not recommended. On the right, the S3 resource was initialized outside the handler, the recommended way. The init duration was a little bit higher in the second Lambda version. That's because, other than importing Boto3, it had to initialize the S3 resource as well. But look at the massive difference right here. The first handler invocation took more than 2 seconds in the first lambda opposed to half a second in the second lambda. Second invocation took half a second opposed to 81 milliseconds. Same goes for the third one, that is a huge difference. The values might not be exactly what you've expected. A fair assumption would be that the first execution duration of the handler should take the same amount of time as the second and third. This might be happening thanks to some internal optimization that Lambda is doing, for example caching. But the main takeaway here is that in the case of the first Lambda, we will be charged for 2000 milliseconds plus 500 milliseconds plus 460 milliseconds, opposed to 500 milliseconds plus 80 milliseconds plus 90 milliseconds, which is not negligible at all. You don't want your lambdas to take more time than they have to. Also, have a look at this. If we move our Boto import inside the handler as well, The execution of our lambda takes more than our timeout value, which is 3 seconds. So the lambda times out and nothing gets done. 
So remember to always initialize these kinds of resources, like for example a database connection, outside of the handler. So far we've been invoking our function sequentially. We have fired an event, waited for lambda to finish processing that event, and only after that we have fired a second event. But what happens if our lambda receives two events at the same time? The cool feature of lambda service is that it supports scaling out of the box. Let's have a look at this scenario. First invocation request comes in. There are no warm instances, so lambda service needs to cold start a new instance of our function. While the first instance is busy processing the first event, we receive a second invocation request. Lambda service sees that the first instance is busy processing the first event, so it will create a new instance from a cold start. The maximum allowed number of simultaneously active instances cannot be higher than the account concurrency limit. To check your account concurrency limit, go to Configuration, Concurrency, and there it is. As you can see, my account concurrency limit is 50, so I can have only 50 Lambda instances running at the same time. Your account concurrency limit might be different. The standard is 1000, but some new AWS accounts start with less than that. You can also open a ticket with AWS to request an increase of your concurrency limit above 1000. Let's see how this automatic scaling works in action. What I have here is our first function open in two separate windows. I will now invoke the function two times, once from each window. But I have to do it really quickly so the first event doesn't get processed before the second invocation. Remember to use the S3 test event. Alright, ready? Let's go. The fact that we are seeing two log streams indicates that we were successful. We've managed to force Lambda service to create two Lambda instances, and both of them were called started. If we were to invoke our function, for example, 80 times at once, Lambda service would create 50 instances, so 50 invocation requests would be successfully processed. Why? Because we are only allowed to have 50 Lambda instances running at the same time. The other 30 invocations would fail with a throttling error. There is much more to concurrency than this. Things like reserved concurrency, provisioned concurrency and burst concurrency quotas. I choose not to talk about them as they are quite difficult to wrap your head around and I don't find them as necessary to understand as the other topics we've talked about. If you're interested in these topics anyway, please refer to the official Lambda documentation on concurrency. There are two ways how Lambda functions could be invoked. There is a synchronous invocation where the client invoking the function sends a request to the Lambda. The Lambda does its job and returns a response to the client. Then there is an asynchronous invocation. If the client is invoking the function asynchronously, it doesn't send the request event directly to the Lambda, but instead it places it on a queue that is internal to the Lambda. After the client successfully places the event on the queue, it considers its job done. The client is not waiting on any response from the Lambda. Then, when our Lambda is not busy, it takes the request event from the queue and processes it. When we click on the test button in the console, we are invoking the function synchronously. We need to wait for Lambda to return a response. One example of a service that invokes Lambda asynchronously is S3. So if we utilize our trigger from previous lessons, we would invoke our Lambda asynchronously. We will first invoke our function synchronously by clicking the test button. Then we will upload a text file into our S3 bucket that will fire our trigger and invoke our function asynchronously.
Now check the logs. The first invocation, which are these lines right here, was asynchronous invocation. The second one was an asynchronous invocation. As you can see, there is no difference between them. So the question you might ask is, why should I care whether the function is invoked synchronously or asynchronously? Where there are multiple reasons. Let's start with the retry attempts. Let's raise an exception in our Lambda code. If we now invoke the function synchronously by clicking the test button here in the console, we get a response saying that the invocation failed with this exception. Let's clean up our logs again. And let's invoke our function asynchronously. Wait for the logs to show up. And we can see our exception here. Let me wait for one minute. All right, let's refresh the logs. Look at that. There was another invocation with the same request ID. I promise you, I didn't do anything while I was waiting. Let me wait for another two minutes. Okay, let's refresh the logs again. Look, another invocation with the same request ID. What's happening here is that by default, Lambda is configured to retry the request two times if the previous attempts fail. We can change the default configuration if we navigate to Configuration Asynchronous Invocation we can change the retry attempts value to one, meaning that the Lambda would retry the failed event once or to zero, meaning Lambda wouldn't attempt to retry the failed event at all. You can't control the time between the retry attempts. It's always going to be one minute between the first two attempts and two minutes between the second and the third one. If all of the retry attempts fail, the event is lost forever. But we might want to retry the event in about an hour, for example. Maybe the lambda won't be failing then. You never know. In order to preserve the event, we should configure a dead letter queue. A dead letter queue is a queue to which messages, in our case events, are sent if they cannot be successfully processed by our lambda. To create a dead letter queue, we will use an AWS Simple Queue service, SQS in short. So let's search for SQS. Create queue. Let's name it first function dash DLQ for dead letter queue. All of the other settings are fine. Scroll down and click on create queue. If we navigate back to our function, we can attach this dead letter queue to our lambda. If we go to configuration, asynchronous invocation, edit, Amazon SQS, and select the queue from the dropdown. Click on save. Ah. Of course, it's not going to be that easy. The Lambda cannot send messages to the SQS. We need to grant it the permission to do so. Luckily, we already know how to do it. So yeah, let's just do it.
the action we want to allow the lambda to perform is SQS send message and resource is going to be the ARN of our SQS queue. Now the dead letter Q is attached to our function. So let's invoke our function asynchronously by uploading a text file to the S3 bucket. Let's check the logs. Right, so the first invocation failed. And there are no messages in the queue. We need to wait for all the retry attempts to fail before the event will show up in the dead letter queue. So let me get back to you after three minutes. Lambda attempted to process the event three times. So if we now refresh the SQS tab, we can see that there is one message in the queue. So if we now go to send and receive messages and click on poll for messages, the message will appear here. We have details tab here, containing bunch of details about the message. The body of the message which is the event that originated from S3. There is the bucket name and the object key. And lastly, we have an attribute tab, which contains information about why this event ended up in the dead letter queue. Let's do a quick recap. So what happened here is, we've uploaded a text file into the S3. That triggered our Lambda function asynchronously placing the event onto the internal Lambda queue. The Lambda then attempted to process the event three times. It wasn't able to successfully process the event because we have configured it to raise an exception no matter what. Thanks to the fact that we have attached a dead letter queue to our Lambda, the unprocessed event was not discarded, but instead it was placed on the dead letter queue. You could then implement some sort of a replay functionality, which would feed the events from dead letter queue back to the Lambda. Or you could process these failed events manually. Another interesting thing about asynchronous invocation is the maximum age of event property. It's saying how long can an event sit in the internal Lambda queue before it gets deleted or sent to the dead letter queue if you have one configured. So let's say the maximum age of event is set to 6 hours. Our Lambda receives an event onto its internal queue because we have invoked it asynchronously. If our Lambda is available, it processes the event immediately. But sometimes the Lambda is under a significant load and it's not able to process the events right away. So if an event spends more than 6 hours in the queue, it gets discarded or sent to the dead letter queue. We can demonstrate this behavior by lowering the value from 6 hours to 1 minute. We also need to make our lambda seem busy, which we can simulate by changing its reserved concurrency to 0. So, if we now invoke the function asynchronously by uploading a text file into the S3 bucket,
and we wait for one minute, the unprocessed event should appear in the dead letter queue. There it is, the body of the event, but more importantly, the attributes tab contains the information on why the event ended up in the dead letter queue. Function not invoked. Function is configured with zero reserved concurrency executions. Right, so we've invoked our function by placing a text file into the S3 bucket. Event was placed onto Lambda's internal queue but it never got processed because we throttled the lambda. Because we have set the maximum age of event property to one minute, the event got placed onto the dead letter queue after spending one minute in the lambda's internal queue.